check, check, check. Oh, I like that echo. <clears throat> um, yeah, so a couple quick announcements. Uh, next week, we got Alex coming in, going to talk to us about hybrid HTML5 apps. Am I right? Is that right? Okay. Yeah, swooping in uh, and uh, filling in. Uh, let's see, speaker, we need a speaker for April 28th. We don't have one yet. So, uh, if you, uh, you know, want to help us out there, that would be wonderful. So, April 28th, still got a few weeks there. Plenty of time to put together a, just an absolute world-shaking, earth-changing talk. Uh, of course, uh, we need speakers for May and June. So, you know. Come talk to me. I'd love to hear you talk. If you're not given a talk before, still come talk to me. Definitely, if you've never given a talk before. Uh, yeah. So there's that. Let's see. Any uh, community announcements? Anybody have anything you want to stand up and say to everybody here and on the live stream? No? Fair enough. All right, so we're going to kick it off here in just a couple more minutes. So sit tight and enjoy those chicken biscuits. All right, so without further ado, really got to get up for, uh, for Paul here today. He swooped in last minute. We had a, um, a speaker drop out, and he, uh, so he swooped in and, and saved our butts. So everybody give up for Paul.
There we go. Is that better? Oh, look at that. So anyway, this has been something that I've kind of been chewing on for a while and finally just decided, let's do it. So uh, purpose of this talk is show and tell. Okay, it's something I've been working on. Cool things I've been thinking about how to do it. What I'm going to show is not what I call a productionable app. It's kind of just a lot of different pieces cobbled together. And honestly, I really love uh, feedback, ideas. We have a, the collective intelligence in this room is spectacular. To say that this is just kind of what I've been thinking about and working on, there's a lot of smart, smart people. So please feel free to make this one very interactive. Because my assumption is when we're talking about performance on a web page, that's something a lot of us know a lot about, but probably no one knows everything about. Okay? So please, please, please feel free to give feedback. The other thing here is don't take this as a definitive list of do's and don'ts. Okay? So uh, what I wanted to start with was uh, let's just talk about what was the original. Actually, let's go down one slide. Ooh. Let's start here with the backstory, and then we'll go back. So here's, this is how we ended up with this need. I needed, our, our sales team needed to know which email service provider a given brand was sending their emails through, okay? So you are the gap, you send your emails through Exact Target or Salesforce Marketing Cloud now, right? That's something that we know because that's something we know. However, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's an effort to that. There's tools out there that exist that you can purchase, $15,000 tools, good job. Way to go, those companies. We just need to enable our sales team, right? So we had some interns, super smart. Kurt Weisenheit and Ben Miojo came in and basically wrote a Chrome extension that, I, you know, based on the sending IP address, looked it up to figure out uh, who the email service provider was. They, uh, they saved it back to a database. It was a bootstrap theme with PHP and MySQL. This uh, particular project was a good candidate for this because it had enough records to make it an interesting, uh, measurable kind of experiment. What was taking place initially was the, the, the bootstrap app that we, we were working with was taking about three to four seconds per page load, okay? I thought, man, can we get that faster? Of course we can get it faster. What do we need to do? What are the different things? And so essentially, I went step by step through this process and I thought this is kind of an interesting uh, outcome, right? So uh, the, initial, the initial plan was three to four seconds per page is what we were taking. Maybe average, maybe not, doesn't matter. So the experiment was, how can we get this down? Uh, the, the page load time is now 300 milliseconds. Each additional view is less than 200 milliseconds. So like, I mean, it's almost instantaneous, especially via the web. Um, uh, initially, there was Bootstrap, uh, pure CSS. Uh, so, so you know, this was the original layout. PHP is MySQL, PHP, PHP. HostGator, that's fine, right? Commoditized hardware. Um, we'll go through these step by step. And actually, you know what we'll do? So we kind of are all on the same page. There it is. OK. So uh, over here, I got the network tab open so we can just see it. And then we've got here. And, and there it is. So quick load, right? We can see it. Uh, load time, uh, 500 seconds, milliseconds maybe. Pretty quick, right? Uh, when we're, when we're recognizing that we're loading 24,000 records, maybe, there it goes, 23,048 records, that's pretty cool. Now, uh, this is why I thought this was such an interesting play, right? So we, I, I, I've got all that open, and you know, just so I'm not full of poo, um, let's do Amazon SES, quick load, we come back, Quick load, MailChimp, that's one we all know probably, down in Atlanta, quick load, right? And so the goal is how do we make this thing so just very rapid fast? And you can see one of the things, and we'll look at this here in a second, one of the things I used was uh, infinite scrolling, right? Using JSON. So, it's, so um, that's kind of high level. Um, I'll get back over to that one. There we go. So that's the, the demo there. What were the rules? What was I trying to accomplish? I wanted the exact same functionality. I just wanted it way, way, way faster. That was the goal. How do I, make, how do I take this three to four seconds per page load, which is standard, traditional, how we've always kind of built apps, how do we get it just faster? 
So I, uh, one of the things is I needed a good data sample size. That's why I thought this was a good one. 23,000 records. I mean, we're not talking enterprise with that, but I think it's enough that we can start to see enough variability in the, in the timings that we can say, yes, this worked, or no, this didn't work. I wanted this to scale inf infinite, infinitely. Infi infinitely. I should have I met with my language coach ahead of time. <laughs> nah, I don't have a language coach. Uh, I want it to be easy to write and easy to understand. The kind of thing that we can sit down, I can show it off, and you guys can go, yeah, that's really cool, or no, that's stupid, Paul, right? Um, so I want, I mean, that's, that's one of those things. Uh, performance is one of those things. We can make things really, really fast, but sometimes it becomes so obfuscated and so complex that no one can, no one can understand it, right? So this one needed to be uh, uh, simple. Now, I also wanted, there are going to be trade-offs, right? I wanted the trade-offs to favor the user experience in terms of that. And then also, I wanted this to be able to ho be hosted crazy cheaply, right? These are the things uh, that, that I was kind of driving towards. So I wanted it to be bigger, better, faster, meaner, okay, BBFM. And so to that end, I thought, well, and, and part of this was, uh, you know, uh, Tim back there, uh, he beats me up a little bit on this, not horribly, but he's like, you need to be mobile first, Paul. You're right, you're right, you're right. So everything that I'm doing here needs to render as fast on my cell phone. Like, there's, there, we, can't put, we can't take any shortcuts by using desktop browser, right? So it needs to be crazy fast. It needs to be flexible and something I would like to program, right? There's a lot of stuff we could also do that's so just inane, it's stupid, right? So let's do something that's fun and then I want to maintain the ease of reading. What did we do? We minimalized everything. That was the plan, right? So starting with a smaller CSS framework than Bootstrap. Bootstrap is awesome, powerful. There's so much to it, right? It's also pretty heavy. It was very interesting. By dropping that, even though we were dealing with cache data. Now, the other thing you should see, I'm going to slow down a little bit. What you guys should know is I've got a little ADD, which means my brain goes faster than my mouth can keep up with, especially about things I'm excited about. So I'm going to find my zen, slow it down. <laughs> anyway, so uh, Bootstrap is awesome, but it is a heavy, heavy thing. So even though it was cached at the browser level, I was finding uh, it was an additional 200 millisecond load time. Why was it 200 milliseconds? Probably on my computer because it's six or seven years old, I'm able to see that, which is actually pretty awesome, right? Um, so I also wanted to drop the jQuery and Bootstrap dependency because both of those represent a fairly substantial download time. The other thing is we need to move everything into smaller chunks of data, right? Um, and then as I was getting more and more fun, it was remove the database dependency, remove the PHP dependency, remove the web server dependency, and then just distribute everything on a content delivery network, right? So what that gives us is the ability to replicate things worldwide, right, with pretty fast hardware that's pretty cheap to use. So first thing was change the CSS framework. Uh, I was originally using Bootstrap, it was cached, but it still uh, shaved 200 milliseconds off because we're talking about 146 kilobytes and 121 kilobytes. There's a whole lot of classes, and, and I know this is one of those things, as designers, we often go, yeah, but I, I have them if I need them. I totally agree with you, but, but in this case, I wanted a more minimalist framework. I looked at quite a few uh, different frameworks. Uh, skeleton, uh, get CSS, there's quite a few that I looked at. Pure CSS was the winner. I really liked it. You can see the file sizes down here. Uh, Gzip, the whole thing is four kilobytes. Man, and, and it gave me a grid system. It gave me uh, 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 form elements. It gave me uh, basically the UI elements that I use most commonly. I didn't have all the uh, uh, bells and whistles of Bootstrap, but in terms of what I was trying to accomplish, which was how fast can I make this thing? Man, this is the framework for me, right? So next thing. I wanted to remove, remove sort of the, the database dependency. Why? Because databases are expensive. And, and the, the particular data set that I had here was the type of thing that uh, really uh, worked very well on a CDN, right? It worked very well out of a database. The data is important, so, so output it to JSON and then apply the, the template within the browser. Okay, so um, my first attempt was handlebars uh, JS uh, worked. Super powerful, cool, right? I used it because I used it five years ago and it was comfortable, right? 
Uh, jQuery, I use that because it was comfortable, but jQuery is also quite large. So my goal is to get rid of that. So that's where, uh, again, Tim beat me up and said, you might want to think about maybe like a, a more modern framework, Paul. Okay, you're right, you're right. So I looked at different client-side frameworks. I looked at Angular, uh, I looked at Backbone, and I looked at Ember. All three, honestly, pretty interchangeable. There's a, if, if you can do it in one, you can probably do it in the other, which you can probably do it in the other. So I was really looking for what had good support, what had people using it, what had, uh, um, and what was small, right? And so, you know, I looked at Backbone, 6.5 kilobytes, that's great, but it required jQuery and underscore, which was an additional uh, 43. So this one ended up being 50 kilobytes. At the same time, I really liked Angular. So that was, again, an easy pick for me to say, let's use Angular, okay? Um, Next, so once I had the Angular pieces in place, um, I wanted a single page application, right? I didn't want to have a whole bunch of round trips to the server, uh, or any round trips to the server needed only to be j uh, data, right? So, um, so I was using a single page application with caching involved in it. Um, uh, what that meant is I pre-rendered all of my JSON files on a schedule. I still have to use the database. I mean, I could go back to old school where we're just writing to file systems, which is awesome. But in this case, or MongoDB, there's a lot of different options, right? But, but in this case, the goal was not necessarily the database, it was to decouple the database, right? Uh, again, at least in this, in this. So to do that, uh, so I pre-rendered the JSON files, I had to identify the key sorts ahead of time, right? So any sorts that I had, had to be identified ahead of time because um, moving that much data around is, there's a lot, right? So, so what are the properties that we need exposed, right? Let's look at, maybe let's look. Yeah, um, and let's go up to, go up to ESPs. So uh, what are the key properties? I wanted to know what are the senders, the three top senders on each individual ESP, okay? So I had to count that and store that ahead of time, right? Um, I wanted to know, uh, Else. Oh, um, sorts. I want to know. Um, I want to know who the Adobe campaigner uh, uh, folks are that are using that. So I needed to identify that and pre-sort that. So everything, any view that we needed, already needed a JSON file associated to it. Okay. So that was that was again one of the the challenges in going through this was identify ahead of time how do I want this displayed, right? Because uh, it's easy enough to add a little, uh, you know, nugget to the output file, but um, this is easy. The other thing was, need these, I need these uh, JSON pages, and I realize that I'm probably the only person in the room that calls them JSON. I'm sorry. I can't, I, I, I was thinking about it ahead of time. I was like, I need to fix that, because I think everyone else is calling it JSON now. I can't, I can't. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I made these as small as I could, small digestible bytes. So yes, it's going to hit the server to pull multiple copies of that, but, um, you know, I used infinite scrolling, which is just called next page with a get, and that is a quick, 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 quick round trip, right? Because we're dealing with a, like a CDN in this case, right? Uh, and then I used infinite scrolling uh, just for the, the, the uh, excitement of that. I think that's a fun one for people. Um, then last kind of piece was I had membership to deal with, right? Um, and this is when I pulled out my old bag of tricks, right? I, needed to, I still wanted it to be password protected, but uh, I, didn't, I didn't necessarily want to deal with session, I didn't want to deal with any kind of server-side code, HT access, we, I was hosting on Apache, that's easy, right? Uh, it still works, um, and so I, at least within this experiment, it was the right solution. Um, so it's simple, um, I, I think it's a little less secure, you guys could probably tell me otherwise. I don't know in that case, but um, uh, certainly simpler, right? Um, uh, then I switched everything over to the .html extension just so that there was not any lingering. I didn't want it to touch the PHP engine at all. Uh, and then I made it so that all images had to be font awesome, right? Um, in, in that case, there's some other things we can do. Um, instead of just doing font awesome, there's like a tool called Fort Awesome that allows you to select the icons. There's different. There's different tools so you can reduce the number of icons that even come into that font awesome pack because one of the things that um, I noticed, you know, I, 
spent a lot of time over here, right, at least in this effort. Uh, I looked at it and I was like, well, what's taking the most time? And it's, it's often the font awesome is, is one of the larger loads. Um, so, uh, so not a big deal. I mean, we're, we're down to 300 millisecond load times, which is really pretty cool, right? And then the last piece was uh, dropping it into a CDN, content delivery network. There's a bunch of them out there. Amazon has them. Uh, Azure has them. There's a bunch of, uh, I'm using a free one right now. But again, the idea is we've got data centers replicated around the world, right? Um, so that we, we push these files out through that mirrored replication. Now, uh, the downside to that is um, uh, if you make any changes, it's going to take a little while to replicate out, right? Um, but that means that folks in India will have the same experience that I have. Um, this came about, I was, I was giving a, a, a presentation in Seattle, and our data server, data center was hosted in Chicago. And it was really amazing to me the latency that showed up just by that round trip hop, right? And so um, this idea that you know the CDN would be a, 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 an interesting delivery mechanism, to say the least, because it's distributed, because it's cached, because it's cheap, right? Because it's easy to uh, deploy to, to mirror to, and, and it sort of supports all of the pieces that are here. Um, there are some additional um, just sort of thoughts that I had around other things that could be done around this. Um, again, how important is it? We're now down to a pretty, I think, rocket fast delivery time that's replicatable and can go as, as deep as we need it to, right, based on paging alone. Um, uh, and part of that is um, preload our JSON resources, right, so that uh, it not, on, not on the view when the um, uh, um, Angular uh, page viewer uh, grabs the data, but you preload it ahead of time, uh, gzipping all the scripts, uh, modifying cache headers. Um, which I think is already probably being done within the uh, CDN. Um, you know, if uh, this was a, an interesting idea, uh, making something a little more read-only uh, or less read-only. So, you know, hitting the CDN and when I know that there's going to be deltas, create sort of a composite feed that would pull in the rest and sort of merge those together. Again, I already talked about four thousand. The other thought I had there was a sprite, using a sprite to contain all of those images um, and then pulling that in. Uh, and then adding right options for users. I thought all those things would probably be pretty, pretty interesting. Any uh, thoughts, ideas, ways that we could improve this? Um, uh, for me, again, this has been a really interesting, fun experiment for me. I love feedback. Um, please? Yeah, go. Uh-uh. -uh. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, so the question was, did I look into keep alive with Apache, uh, which essentially keeps, the, keeps this, the stream open so that instead of making a whole bunch of page round trips, it's probably just additional requests back and forth. That's awesome. No, I hadn't even thought about that. Yeah. Yeah, well. Infinite scroll likes to, to, it doesn't cache well. Uh, um, font awesome is a, a large file, but caches pretty well. Okay. Um, where uh, infinite scroll is not cached very well. Right. Yeah. The, no, no, no. Uh, what, what I found was that the infinite scroll didn't cache very well, but, um, but uh, font awesome did. It was just larger. Yeah. Right. I did. I, I played around with it. Um, minifying would absolutely, that plus the gzipping would, would absolutely, I think, reduce file size some. Yeah. Absolutely. I, but I didn't do it. <laughs> Other questions, ideas? Yeah. So you start uh, iteratively with the original solution and then you pieced in, yep. okay, I'm gonna take out the database and do yep. JSON? Yes, Okay. one piece at a time. A okay, as you were doing that, did one one of the changes you made 
like taking out the database, stand out as the biggest return on investment? Yeah, I mean, it really was. The, 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 the trip from, uh, you know, the trip from Bootstrap over to pure CSS was small. That was, that was more like the, uh, uh, you know, the layup. <laughs> What's up? Uh, the, um, but, but moving it out of MySQL um, was a big piece um, and, and into JSON because, because again, there's just no round trip there. Um, the other thing that was really interesting was uh, moving to a single page application with Angular because again, all of those uh, page renderings were just gone. Okay, part two. Uh, what's the biggest your JSON files got? Um, the sender's file right now, it's like 10, 11K. So um, that's, that's the only one that I worry about uh, growing uh, and so coming up with a solution there. Uh, because, um, just because there's a lot of senders in the world, and as this, as as we add senders to the to the to the mix, bro. yeah. So I noticed you're doing a lot of uh, Git requests for various different files. Have you uh, experimented at all for um, kind of combining your minified CSS and then using Browserify for JavaScript files and I stuff like that. I thought about it. I have not touched it. Have you Have you done that? Played with it? Uh, I haven't played with it a whole lot. I have done a little bit, but mainly with uh, more hybrid apps type of thing. Not a whole lot with uh, network stuff. But sure. it's stuff that I've definitely looked at, and uh, I think it. I mean, it, I, I see that it could definitely work in this case. Anybody done that? The idea of sort of combining all of your files into one and. Uh, what kind of performance impact that has? Is that worth the effort? Yes? Okay. Other questions, ideas, thoughts? Have you messed it at all with Redis caching? Redis caching. I love Redis. Uh, that's sort of my uh, Achilles heel. I think Redis is awesome, and it's super crazy fast, right? Uh, my server didn't support it. Uh, so I've played with Redis caching before, um, but uh, in this case, it wasn't an option. Other ideas, thoughts? Uh, poke holes in it too. Like, th again, this for me, this was this was really truly about being an experiment. And I would love, I love critical stuff too. What's done wrong here? No, go ahead. If you go under Adobe campaign and like look at the list, right now they're all alphabetical, and I thought they were sorted by date, but because they don't seem to be alphabetical or by number, how are they currently sorted? Right. Some of them had a huge list. Yes, they do. Like Salesforce Marketing Cloud, we have a ton of those folks in there. Um, it's sorted by when those were entered into our system. So most recent. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And so um, where it should be, I think, is based on uh, that number, which is the number of messages that are in the that are in that given sender. But yeah, again, uh, you have to predefine what your sorts need to be. And yeah, they, they, it falls apart a little bit. Other ideas, thoughts, ways to, pre what's the most interesting, oh, go ahead. I was just gonna ask if you'd looked into uh, reducing any of the Angular digest and render times at all, like using one-way bindings or anything like that. Yeah, that's a good question, I did. I did use one-way bindings. You know, I was just kind of starting to dig in a little bit on that, and I can show you on, maybe I can show you. Maybe, come on. Um, let's go to templates. Actually, let's just go to pure. That's gonna be our best one. Preloaded that template here. You can see I did, I, I did a, a, a binding that way, a one-way binding. So that, uh, and what that means, and again, I'm not by any means the expert on Angular, but what, what that means is rather than sort of creating a binding where that if we update uh, this field here, uh, item, ID, it will then automatically update on our screen, which is really, really powerful and cool. However, if you have data like mine that's not going to change, uh, by prepending it with two colons, that says it's a one-time bind. Uh, so I did that. Uh, I looked a little bit into um, you know, these two curly braces versus uh, ng-bind. Uh, 
because I, I read a fair amount saying, uh, man, the ng-bind is much, much faster. Do it that way. I didn't necessarily see that, but again, uh, I may not have enough, um, enough data to, to, to justify that particular play. Where others might have, where, you know, others who are using two-way binding may have that issue more. What's, uh, what's, what's the best takeaway from this? I know, see me, I'm asking questions. Sorry, Paul nerd. Yeah. Yeah, well that's absolutely right, right? I mean in terms of building applications. Yeah. Right, w work on speed last. I think that's a great, like, there's so many things we can do if we focus on speed in the beginning, we're in trouble. That being said, when we, we can apply some best practices in the original designing phase to make that a little less painful. Yeah. No, I think that's a great takeaway. Speed is not the most important thing, right? Speed is an Im has, has an impact on usability. Absolutely it does. But at the end of the day, if your application does not work, we're in trouble. What else? Right. But really make sure you open those developer tools and say, okay, this is the one that's actually taking the most time. And right. Pay attention to like the database. I mean, yeah, it sucks because databases are boring, but <laughs> that, if that's your best game, then do that first. Right. Profiling essentially is what you're saying. Like th we all have the, we all have our, um, um, what we like to work on. Uh, let me fix this first. Well, that may not be your pain point, right? That may not be the hot path. And so, um, you know, in the browser, there's fantastic tools to say what's going on. I had a fantastic, uh, uh, interesting thing last night. I'm, 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 I'm playing with it, and my load times just kept going up, and I couldn't figure out why. Uh, I had some Chrome extensions running, and I read an article that said, if you have Chrome extensions running, you're going to see performance hits. And I did. It was like 200% uh, slower. Oh, well, that's kind of interesting. Well, it makes sense, right? It's running in the browser and different. But, but um, but yeah, that came because I did profiling, right? Why, why, what is the hot path? How do I solve that? And so, you know, starting sort of, here's the whole application scope from start to finish. Where is my hot path? Let's address that, even if it's not sexy, right? I mean, let's be honest, databases are sexy. Yeah. So hypothetical question here. Um, obviously your data is pretty small because you're able to send it in advance with JSON files. Right. Um, so, you know, pre-process that for the right. user, deploy it on CDN, that kind of thing. Um, say you had big data to the point where, you know, you had files that were um, a couple megabytes in size if you're dealing with large enough data. Right. Um, how would you approach that? In a, so, so essentially the question was, you know, in this case, it chunks pretty well because I have small records, right? Small records chunk well. Big records don't. You're dealing with graphic files. I mean, there's different ways that this can, can load up. How, how, the, the question was, how would you approach that? Uh, I'm going to take a stab, but I'd love to throw that out to say, does anybody else have any ideas? If you had, instead of small records that chunk well, you have large records, how could you optimize for performance with those? I know, I, 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 yeah, go. Pre-chunk Pre it, right. So, Unless so the processing time to create those files is longer than your refresh rate, but I mean, I don't know how big data you're, you're, um, you were suggesting for your question, but. Yeah, no, I think, I think there's an interesting, what I would do in looking at that, and I, and I, well, sorry, what I would explore when looking at that, and I don't know if the payoff would be here or not, right? I would still break those files up into smaller pieces and reassemble them at the browser level because you could parallelize the streams to the browser, I think, right, and then reassemble them at the browser. Again, I, I don't know if that would work or not, but it'd be a fun one to play with, wouldn't it? Would it make sense then, 
uh, maybe to build a, an API that you query just the data that you need when you need it type of thing. Sure, and, and there, there are um, uh, client-side databases. Hey, Tim, what's that client-side database we talked about? What was that client-side database we talked about? Uh, Look. So there are some that, that exist that live that may already be there ready to do that. Things I didn't play with. Any other ideas on that? When you've got bigger chunks of data, breaking that into smaller pieces or how to optimize that? Because again, this is, these are problems we're all probably facing and solving. It's okay if not, yeah, John. Right. So, so the, uh, the, the point that John brings up, and I absolutely love it because I faced this, right? And that is uh, make sure you need the data that's coming down. So uh, an example for me was on the message record, okay? So uh, each message record, uh, I, was, I, I store the DKIM record and all of the, the header information um, because that's interesting to me and I want to have access to that later, right? Um, hopefully, I was going to say, hopefully I don't have anything that's embarrassing here. Um, so original. Okay. So I'm storing all of this data here up until about right there, right? I don't want to get into privacy issues, so if some, something sneaks through, I keep the subject line and the pre-header, right? But I keep all that information, return path, received, reply to, because um, you never know when it will be interesting, valuable for our sales team to know. But I don't need to output that to my JSON file, right? I had all of this coming out, and my JSON files were getting quite large. So I had to kind of look at it and go, let me get rid of some of this stuff that's not necessary, right? Let's reduce that in our view, only produce the, the fields necessary for the view. Now that's a good, good thought, John. Anything else? Right, preload, pre progressive rendering, do some preloading, load in the background while like, anticipate what your users might need. I mean, honestly, profile where your users are going so you can anticipate and predict and preload that stuff. Cool, fun stuff. Was there another thought, question, idea? All right, well, um, what I'll, I'll do is I'll, I'll ship this off to Brett, the, um, the, the deck. Um, any, any of the um, suggestions that I remember, I'll make sure I put in here. But I think it would be interesting to sort of create a collective kind of, here's ideas. Because uh, as, when, I mean, we all face that moment. We're just beating our head against the wall going, this thing is taking way too stinking long, right? And so what are, the, what are the bag of tricks that we have that we can pull from to make this better? I mean, I think that's the power of this type of group, try to have. So, and uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll see if I can add that all to the deck here and then, and then we can ship it around. I don't know if there's a good place to put that or not, but who knows. Anyway, that's, that's my experiment. Thank you guys for listening and participating. I know we were working all day. Just let me sit and listen. I don't really want to participate. So anyway, thank you guys. Thanks, Paul. Uh, so, yeah, next week, again, we got Alex coming to us uh, with hybrid HTML5 apps and speaker for 28th. Come talk to me. I know you're out there. Live stream, talking to you too. All right, see you guys next week. <laughs>